What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Masters of None. I'm Jay. With me is Mike. Hello. And Arts. Hello. And welcome to uh, our second or third installment. Who knows where, which way we're going to put this of uh, our writing edition of uh, Masters of None. Uh, we, we got a very special guest rejoining us. We had him way back when he was just a, a budding uh, book author and Twitter viral Twitter sensation with uh, Shit My Dad Says, uh, which became a TV show. Uh, then he had another book out called uh, I Suck at Girls, which became a TV show. And now he's back. Uh, he's uh, the executive producer of the Harley Quinn animated series, which we're huge fans of uh, and the writer on that. So uh, welcome back to Mr. Justin Halpern. What's up, Justin? What's happening, guys? Thanks for having me uh, back on 12 years later. <laughs> this, is <my> longest, <laughs> this is my longest relationship. <laughs> Mine too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like said, uh, like most of our guests, you know, you guys continue to rise, and then we uh, continue to to you know, it's funny. We we like we made money. We would get things like semi-viral when we started, and now we're just like, it, we're, we're we're succeeding downward. Like we, as <laughs> you, you got to get into Hollywood where you can fail upwards. Like I've done. <laughs> <laughs> we try, man. All everything we talk about on, on our show ends up becoming someone else's joke or sketch on a show or tv show it's wild like the way it happens i guess i guess if you're just in it this long things you do will have parallel thought but it, it happens it crazily happens a lot and yeah. we're just like yeah, yeah remember we talked about that two years ago and that's a thing now <laughs> weird <laughs> Yeah, it's wild. If you really want to interview, we just need a job from you. That's what we're asking. Yeah, yeah that's it. <laughs> this, is a, this is a job interview. I apologize. Oh, good. I didn't, I hadn't realized. I, all right. All right. My assistant sent me the info. I didn't really look it over. So, uh, this is called the pitch cast. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, first of all, patent man, pending, uh, patent pending, though. No yeah, one else think our yeah, I'll watch, I'm watching next week. There'll be 40 podcasts called pitch cast. Uh, but, uh, congrats, man. Uh, first off, we're, we're huge Harley Quinn fans. Yeah. Big time. Oh, thank Pretty you. Unbelievable show. I mean, we did, you know, we're huge Batman fans. We did a whole series of podcasts where we uh, watched the Batman 66 series and did a show on each episode. Oh, wow. So, so we're pretty hardcore. And uh, man, this is like the, the Harley Quinn series is just <laughs> mind, mind blowing. These guys were into it. And like, I didn't even know it existed until I guess, <laughs> dude, after I, the two seasons from from like minute one and a half, you're like, oh, OK, this is something. That's, that's funny that you know because when we decided to when when we first were writing the pilot for that show as i wrote it with um, my partner patrick schumacher and and also a person we partnered with on the show this guy dean laurie who worked at arrested development for many years and uh when we were ready we were like okay we need to this is a cartoon based off of a kid's property we, but it's for adults. We need to like make sure in the first 30 seconds of this show that you know it's not for kids. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think the first line is like, look, us listen up, you pieces of shit. Like it was, I can't remember exactly what it was, but yeah. but we we tried in those early, you know, and, and, and I remember too, because we premiered it at Comic-Con. So no one had seen it but us and the writing staff. And you know, it was premiered at Comic-Con in front of like 2,500 people. And I remember just being like, I'm feeling like I was going to like shit my pants because I was so <laughs> nervous because, again, I was like, how are, are people going to like this? Is this going to be? And and we got a laugh on the first joke and then I settled in. I was like, OK, all right, we're going to be all right. Like, well, what a what a what a crazy gift and curse to be handed the keys to that, you know, that sandbox. But yet knowing that that comic world is such a huge you know fan driven uh thing like like it's amazing i have the keys to the kingdom but if i screw this up like i'm gonna just go down in history as the guy who ruined the whole harley quinn universe yeah and also like you know i grew up a huge batman the animated series fan yes. Yes. um i think it's like that was it was really groundbreaking when it came out there was nothing like it i mean i remember as a kid even like not fully understanding how but it was so much different than everything else that was out there for kids and so it holds a special place in my heart and i remember thinking like you know i don't want to fuck this up because you know i'd be essentially like shitting on this piece of my like childhood that i was really important to me informative to me as a writer um you know and so so there was a, just a felt like a lot of pressure on all on all sides do you get pressure from the studio at all 
um, you know, because th- some of some of the the direction that you're bringing these characters, you know, you're kind of like touching every Batman taboo that's out there and just <laughs> shattering it to pieces, which I love, which is just fantastic because a lot of it is absolutely ridiculous, and you kind of call that out. But do you get pressure? Did you, did you have you ever gotten pressure from like the studio to like, oh uh, no, you can't mess with Batman too much, like? What the note process of this must be wild sometimes for you? It well, okay. So before it, before we tested it, and we were just writing the scripts, and it hadn't even been animated yet, the studio was supportive but really nervous. Like yeah. I remember, we had this conversation. Our version of Jim Gordon in the show, Commissioner Gordon in the show, my favorite character. Yeah, my my what am 100%. I do? And he's this like PTSD'd out police commissioner because our pitch was like the real commissioner Gordon every day is like the movie seven for him. Like the <laughs> Goth- Gotham city so fucked up that like this man would not, he would be like hanging on by a thread. His like mental health would be so his grasp on reality would be so tenuous, you know? So we wrote, we had, we were friends with Chris Maloney. We had done a show with him and we said to Chris, like, look, you play unhinged like barely keeping it together very well. Do you want to do this? And he said, yeah. And so I remember we did the first record of Permission of Gordon and the studio was like, this is like, Gordon is, is a hero. He's like a hero in the Batman universe. And this man is like, uh, he's falling apart. He's so like pathetic and sad. And we were like, but that's what he'd be. He never... <laughs> Even if he has a success, the credit goes to Batman. Like he doesn't ever, he, he, it is a thankless job that he fails at most of the time. Like that's what we want to do. And they were just like, I don't fucking know about this. And then we tested it. And literally to a person, everybody was like, that's my favorite character. Is Commissioner yeah. Gordon. And then they kind of started to back off. I remember we had two battles with them. They were so supportive. It was crazy. We couldn't believe it at for. I think we also benefited from the fact that there was like a regime change at DC Comics when this was happening. And so the people who were a little nervous left be- uh, before the new people came in and we, we got a little farther down the road and to the new people who came in, we were like, yeah, everybody said this was great. You know, like we were kind of just like trying to, you know, budget. And uh, I remember we had two things in the second episode, the whole plot hinges around this kid lot this like 13 year old boy lying about having finger banged someone at camp <laughs> at camp and they were like you cannot have an episode hinge on whether or not this kid is finger banged someone and we were like but we really believe in this and we, <laughs> i was having these super serious conversations about finger banging it was so <laughs> stupid and they let us do it. They let us, they ended up letting us do it. And, and, and then the other thing, the only time we got like real push, they're, they're a little like touchy with the heroes, you know, our show's mostly villains, right? So right. they like villains, they're, they're uh, more okay with, but uh, like doing anything. But I remember we had, we, we had, we had our first version of Aquaman was like, he was like a super bro. He was just like, uh, he was like somebody you'd meet in San Diego who just like always has his shirt off at the end of the night. And he's like walking home drunk from the bar. And they were like, <laughs> no, you can't do that for Aquaman. But other than that, they kind of just let us do whatever we wanted to do. Uh, I got to say the, the introduction of Aquaman where he, he says something about that's, that's, uh, that's what she said. And then high fives the dolphin I laughed so long. I had to sp- rewind it because I missed like 30 seconds. I was laughing so long at that. That was amazing. Oh, that's that's one of my favorite jokes oh, in the whole season. That, that that one, just that he has these like hype men that are just like dolphins and other <laughs> dumb creatures and he speaks their stupid language and they, they all high five each other. It was like, we, we our idea was like Aquaman lives in the water where he's the king and he's just like every animal is his yes man. So like, what's he going to be like when he has to talk to actual humans? <laughs> So oh, great. It's just, so- it's, sorry it's just layered with so many jokes like the jokes per minute man is just off the charts and it's yeah. like it's i feel like we've never had that before in any kind of superhero you know series or anything let alone one where you know you you have that full freedom and and to go dark and super dark with with stuff too so it's it's like kudos man it's 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 one oh, of the thank best you. comedies like period on tv right now i feel like oh thank you so much yeah i mean it was really like you know my favorite 
thing is joke writing. Like I love Veep and I love The Simpsons and I love like all those show 30 Rock where they're just like pounding you with jokes. If there's a joke you don't like, there's another one coming two seconds later and you might like that one, you know? <laughs> and I, I, yeah, <laughs> and I, I, that's how I kind of feel about joke writing is like if you... You, you you just have it coming rapid fire you know it's it's the people will just appreciate that you're trying to you know make them laugh with these like character-based uh jokes and and so that was a real important part of the of what we wanted to do with the show i'm guessing though too you have so many great voice actors and just regular actors for the, that series and all that and you know you, you get the the main cast on there you get them all done but then like after a while like you, everyone's having so much fun were people asking you to come on and be like uh like a voice on the show like how did that work because i'm just guessing with all of these great names all these great actors and actresses where people were like hey put me in there i don't care who i am just put me in there <laughs> this year is the first year so we're writing season three right now and season three is the first time because you know we made the first two seasons before it even aired so we had finished them so so sometimes you'd get people who would be like like i remember we really wanted giancarlo esposito to play lex luther he's like he played gus fring in breaking bad right and like we really wanted him and and he didn't know the show from anywhere because it hadn't come out yet but it's a, it's an easier pitch to be like hey do you want to play lex luther you know it's like if you know comic <laughs> books you're like that's a fun character to play um, but this year was the first year that people were like, hey, like, can I play something on there? You know, and then that that's where you want to be. Like, that's the sweet spot of like, you know, you don't have to battle to to get cast. It's like people are like, oh, I get what the show is. I want to be a part of it. I like it. And uh, I'd love to do a voice on it. And then you're like, great. Just, we'll give, just kind of give, us one. give us one. Who's coming up? Oh, in this season, you know, we haven't started casting we've we're like halfway through writing we haven't started record doing any of the records yet because that kind of happens a little later so we haven't um we haven't cast any of the new new voices yet um but i wish i had somebody i could give you because they're all like up in the air and i don't want to jinx them um but uh sorry who's, who's like a, who's like a wish list who's who, anybody on a wish list that you would love to cast for something down the road my my wish lists are really weird so like I'm not, to me, it's like, uh, <laughs> like, I really want to have a, a group of three supervillains together that are like Nathan Fielder and John <laughs> Wilson from How To John with John Wilson and like Joe Para, like people who have like a bunch of <laughs> villains who have these like really meek kind of like old men voices. <laughs> Um, oh my gosh, Mad so, Hatter! You got to get someone like Mad Hatter on there. The, the Mad Hatter's gonna be the Mad Hatter's yes. in this season. Yes, he's our favorite. Actually. Man. Oh, that's so funny. He's... I have a shirt from the 1966 I ordered on Etsy of just his big ass face that was like <laughs> from that. And my my family looks at me weird when I when I rock the shirt, but I'm like, hat factory. That's all I, I mean, I just love that. <laughs> you gotta he have is, that. He's a villain in one of the episodes. I will give that away. <laughs> oh my God, that excites us so much. The, you gotta go back and check out the Mad Hatter episodes of the 66 series because that guy just hammed it up with this crazy <laughs> accent so hard. And Hat factory. Hat factory. If Mike's got the clip, he could probably play. Here, here it is. Hat factory. Hat factory. Hat factory. <laughs> That's amazing. His wow. That he would put on everything. Oh my God, you got to go back and just get that reference and drop a little something in because it is amazing. I also it's bought that... this doll. I bought like a doll, like, you know, back in the day, like one of those, like, you know, 1980, do uh, yeah, 1980, like dolls. I forgot the... Uh, the music the string the the before, but it was just like it was so great and then um just quickly just because Diedrich Bader played Batman in you know different series Vanessa Marshall she uh does a lot of voice acting for different series in DC did they ever like did anyone who has done voice acting for like DC being like wait we can really say this like Vanessa like, especially okay <laughs> Van I remember because Vanessa we hired because like I mean you 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 guys know who she is because she's like you know a big dc like voice actress but like most people don't they you'd say vanessa marshall who is that but they don't know that if they've watched a cartoon they've heard her you know what i mean like she's done right. so many right but so vanessa just sort of took the job 
not knowing what it was. <laughs> and then I remember I was there the first day that Vanessa was there in the booth and she was like, what the fuck is this? Like, <laughs> she was like, I've never, what is this show? Cause she just thought she was coming in for like a Saturday morning, like cartoons, DC girls or whatever it was gonna be. <laughs> Cause that's what she does. And she was, and Vanessa is like a really talented comedian. Like she's been doing it a long time. And she was yeah. like, let me do this show as much as I'll do whatever you want. As long as you on this show, like, let me do it. Um, Cause yeah. And I remember Diedrich, especially like, cause Diedrich was Batman on Brave and the Bold yeah. and Brave and the Bold had, has a real sense of humor to it. You know, like it, it's, it's, it's got a, a tone and it, it's like really this, going, <laughs> no, it's not like this. And I remember Diedrich, there's this one scene at the end of like the third episode of our season where Batman is having a heart to heart with, with Robin about finding a nemesis. And it's kind of like posed, it's kind of like the premise is that finding your nemesis is like, it's like finding the per first person you're gonna sleep with, you know, like, find, you know? And so he's like, he's like saying, dad, would you know, like little 12 year old Damien whose voice by Jacob Tremblay, uh is like what how'd you know what it was right when you met your nemesis and they have this little like conversation and at the end damien's like also when can i have sex and, and then <laughs> batman like shoots his battering and zips out of the scene because he doesn't want to have the conversation and i remember that scene diedrich was like what the fuck is this <laughs> <laughs> he was so game diedrich's diedrich's amazing he's such a talented uh actor it's awesome all right so we could we could just talk about harley quinn the whole time but we want to get back to into like the process of writing how you kind of got your start um so the shit my dad says twitter feed was really what kind of set you off and it was like a retweet right from robert cordry who kind of blew up that twitter feed yeah a little bit about that because I, I love like how people get their breaks and and for you know people who are listening to this who are aspiring writers like what people have different paths and it's you know for people who do stand up it's like the thing you hear is, uh, oh, you want to be a stand-up? Go do stand-up. Find an open mic and go start doing it. But like for writers, it's like, well, you can be writing, but then what do you do with it? Like, like so, yeah, the routes you could go to kind of get your break. Like you can write and then what? It's like, okay, I wrote all these spec scripts and books, book treatments and that kind of thing. But it's like, where do you go from there? But talk a, bit, a little bit about how you got kind of your break. Uh, well, my story will be enraging to anyone who is uh, <laughs> wants to be a writer. Um, so, I mean, in some ways, so I, uh, graduated college 2003 and, uh, I was a film major and I moved out to LA and I had a writing partner and we were trying to write features and break in and I was waiting tables the entire time and, and just, you know, like we sold the feature, but it didn't get made and we didn't make much money off of it. And I was still waiting tables the whole time. And, and then, uh, and then I moved, I was like, literally, I got a, I finally got a real writing job, which was just writing for an online uh, magazine, Maxa magazine, which back in the day was a, was a thing. And now I don't even know if it exists. Um, but uh, I got a job writing in there and, and I, but I was like kind of in between, I had just split up with my girlfriend and I didn't know where I was going to live. And I was kind of like, do I give up writing, trying to write movies and TV in LA? Cause I just like, wasn't, it wasn't, make I wasn't making it um and I was like figuring out what I was gonna do and I'm from San Diego and so I was like oh, I'll just live with see if I can live with my parents for a little while while I'm like deciding what I'm gonna do and I have this like gig that I could kind of work from anywhere and so I I did and I was living with my parents and I had I, my dad is like you know kind of a larger than life character um and I would kind of like write down some of the things he said because I was like oh maybe I'll just use him in something and I would have him as my G chat status. You remember when you could have a G chat status? It was like whatever, you know. Yes. And uh, and one of my friends was like, you know, why don't you put those on a Twitter feed? It was like Twitter had just started. It was like 2009. Like, nah, like the only people on it were like CNN and Ashton Kutcher. It was like nobody. It was like <laughs> those were the famous <laughs> people that were on it. Nobody had a million followers yet. Um, and so. Uh, I was like, ah, all right, I'll do that. And I, I put it in, I, I put a couple up and I never really checked it. I, I didn't, I just wasn't like, cause I wasn't putting it up for anything other than just like, I'd send it to some friends or something like that. And then uh, one of my friends who, who he ran like a fake Michael Bay Twitter account, like back when that was like, <laughs> nobody was even doing parody accounts. Uh, and uh, he had like a couple thousand followers and he, 
he was like, can I retweet one of your tweets? And I was like, sure, uh, go for it. I, and he retweeted one and I had no, I had three people following me probably. And then the next day I had like a thousand people following me. I was like, Oh, Whoa, that's crazy. Went from three to a thousand. Like that's nuts. You know, he had like 3000 people following him. So I was like, Oh, it's no big deal. And then Rob Cordry retweeted one of the tweets and he like said something, he like quote tweeted it with just like, this is really funny or something like that. And then all of a sudden it was like, I went from 3000 to the next day, 30,000 to the next day, a hundred thousand. And by the end of the week I had 400,000 followers and I had, it was crazy. I mean, I had like networks calling to be like, we just want to take the property off the table. Like, let us buy it. Right. It was, it was nuts. It was nuts. And <laughs> oh. it, it was like, you know, and, and again, like I had been, how many power fit. lunches did you have? <laughs> yeah. I didn't even know how to get to the power lunch at that point. Like I was like, what the fuck is happening here? And I had a manager at that time. I had a literary manager, but for TV or for movies, you know, like we were, and again, we were really unsuccessful. Um, and 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 I, but we had written a lot of stuff. We had a lot of like, I had a, a pilot, we had a pilot written, we had our samples written, we had a bunch of stuff. And so we kind of gathered this pitch. We like put together this pitch of what the show could be. Um, and I think we were benefited in some ways by the fact that we had no idea what the fuck we were doing because we didn't know enough to be like terrified of this opportunity that was being thrown our way and not realizing if we fucked this opportunity up there would be no other opportunities um and so we kind of just we went in there and we we pitched this idea to a couple studios and the studios were like yeah we like this we want to pair you with showrunners who could like actually turn this into something um and we knew we didn't know enough to do we were just like okay that that's what we want too we don't know enough to do anything with this so uh these two guys who created will and grace they became the showrunners on it and they uh ended up co-writing part of the pilot um and it went to, we cast william shatner and this is all happening within the course of like five months so from five wow. months i went from zero zero followers on twitter to like meeting William Shatner because he's going to play my dad, you know? Uh, so it was insane. Jeez. It was crazy. And Does your dad take all the credit? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. He, so he didn't really give a shit. Like he didn't really care. He wasn't interested in meeting William Shatner. He did meet him, but he didn't care about it. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're the um, TV me. All right, good luck. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. He, he, he um, me. <laughs> yeah he uh he didn't really care but uh he he did think the show was bad which the show was bad but um you know uh and so that was kind of how i remember being on that show and being like okay i've caught this really lucky break i was fortunate enough to have been writing a lot before that so that i had samples and i had kind of some things in place so that when the show went they allowed us to be writers on the show right um and that and, and i remember being on the show thinking like this show kind of fucking sucks but if i just work hard and like keep my head down and do the best job i can possibly do maybe if this show gets canceled we'll get a job on another show and that's kind of what happened that that is almost exactly what happened is we you know we did that show we did 18 episodes of that show um wasn't good and then we uh we decided we went out for you know other shows the next year we got staffed and we just kind of continued to like build our career and work and be you know people that were hard workers that people liked working with and that's what carried us to when i wrote my second book and then we got to actually be the showrunners of that show we we did that show so that was kind of how i broke in that's awesome. Well, how, how, so go even before that, how do you take whatever you have written and get that like manager, that literary agent? Like, Yeah, no. So that, cause I know that everybody always glosses over that. They're like, yeah. And so, you know, I took it to my agent and you're like, hey, wait, wait, how the fuck did you get changed? Yeah. Um, you know, we, this is, remember, you got to remember this is 2004. So things are way different then. Um, and we, so what we did was we got a book 
that had all the management companies in LA in it. And we had written a feature length screenplay and we sent a query letter, which is just like a one page letter that says, uh, hey, here's what my script is about. Would you like to read it? You know, um, it kind of, you know, sells your script in a paragraph and then says, would you like to read it? Uh, and we sent out 50 query letters. And of the 50 query letters, three of them wrote back. One of them wrote back and just wrote on the piece of paper we sent, just wrote in big letters, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, who took the time to do that? <laughs> just don't respond. You wrote no. You didn't even want to use your own piece of paper. You just wrote on mine. Um, dick move. I just have yeah. to say, it's, it's funny because I forgot what guests we were trying to get for our show. And they took away the, like, oh, the that's subject right. title and they just wrote no. Yeah. That. So I just... <laughs> That's the digital equivalent of that. Yes. Of, of your story. That's funny. I was <laughs> like, well, at least they replied, right? Yeah. I mean, I didn't feel like that at the time. I was like, what the fuck? Um, so, uh, and then, so, so the other two were like, yeah, I want to read your script. And we sent the script and both of them were like, we'd be interested in representing you guys. And so we met with them both and we, we picked one and that's how we got a manager, but we didn't, we couldn't get an agent until shit. My dad says stuff happened. We were, you know, agents are, agents are kind of more like stockbrokers in a sense of like, they're wanting to like sell and make money. You know, they're not really as interested in like, kind of like, you know, grooming a career um, at that point, they kind of have to produce otherwise, you know, they're not going to have a job. Um, and so that was how we got our manager. And that was how we got started in features. So that was the old way in 2004. What's the new way now? Like, how does it work now? Man, the new way is like... I on a, <laughs> It's TikTok. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, honestly, the new way is making stuff. It's like writing stuff online or making videos online or, you know, doing that kind of like just trying to put your stuff out there as much as you possibly can. And that that's the easiest way. There are still some of the older traditional ways, which is like, you know, getting a job in the mailroom at an agency and then working your way up and being able to like make those relationships. And then with the right time, you, you pass your stuff on or getting a job on a show as a writer's PA, you know, those are hard to, jobs to get though. Like, honestly, sometimes it's harder to get a job as like a writer's PA than it is to get a job as a writer, you know, like, I mean, it's hard to get a job as a writer, but like there are 10 spots in a writer's room. There's only one writer's PA, you know, and everybody's trying to get that job. So, um, so I think that the, the way to like stand out is to like make stuff, write stuff, like, you know, always be creating stuff. And that's the kind of stuff that will, uh, I said stuff a lot, but that, that's not the writer. Uh, those are the kind of things that get you noticed. And then once you're noticed, then have all those other things that are ready, you know, have your script that's ready, have your, your book that's ready, whatever it is. Um, and I think that's really the new way. You see a lot of people getting work and breaking in that way. Right on. That's great, man. That's great. So, as you go from one thing to the next, um, you know, do more people, do you need more people than just a manager or an agent? You know, what, what are the things, do you, do you separate them into like, you know, do you have a print agent and a film agent and that kind of thing? Or how does that work? Yeah. I mean, you know, I have a, I have a book agent for, for when I write books, um, but I haven't written a book in a while, but I've been working on a book for a long time. Uh, so yeah, I have a book agent and then for, you know, entertainment industry stuff, I have a TV agent and, or I'm at an agency. And, and if I wrote features, there'd be somebody from that agency who would be the one who would represent me for that. And, and, uh, you know, I have, uh, a manager. I, I used to have a manager. I don't have one anymore. We kind of, we decided we kind of didn't need one anymore because we'd been working for a while. Um, cause you know, it ends up like I have, so if you think about it like this, when you have an agent and a manager and a, a lawyer, which you usually ha you have to have, um, you know, an agent takes 10%, a lawyer takes 10% or 5% and a manager takes 10%. So that's 25%. I also have a partner who takes 50%. You know, we split a paycheck. So out of uh, every dollar, I'm probably only walking away with like 35 cents, you know, out of every dollar. So uh, it's, it's um, which is not like a fun way to think about it. And also like, you know, we're well compensated. So it's not a com complaint, but it just means like you, you think about 
who you're paying out money to and if they're worth that money to pay out to. I love the writing partner title. That's, that sounds like the best gig out there because every, every, you know, successful writer or, you know, director, comedian always mentions that side. Oh yeah. My writing partner and I like, that seems like the, the sweet gig, like, especially, you know, if, especially if the, if the other person is the famous face of whatever the thing is, you know, like a Judd Apatow or, you know, Will Ferrell slash Adam McKay, like, yeah, you know, that's a bigger example, but that writing partner, that sounds like the sweet gig, like right, right <laughs> down there. Is it or no? I don't think he would think that uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, we, you know, we are, we are very much an equal partnership in that we've been together for 20 years. You know, we've, we've, we went to, we did college films together, you know? And so like the only thing I write without them are my books. That's it. Everything else we do together, you know? So every script we wrote, we wrote together, you know, every, when we run a show, we run that show together. Um, it's, it's, uh, I know that there are partnerships that are kind of like what you're talking about, where it's like, you know, Judd Apatow will be like, I need somebody to write this thing with me. I'm going to pluck some younger writer out of the, out of the woodwork and, and we're going to do this thing together. Um, my partnership's very much like a marriage, you know, it's like we're, we've been together, we're equal partners and, and, you know, we have, we each have different strengths and, and I think that's why we work, we work well together. So talk about talk about that process a little bit. I mean, writing with somebody else, you know, is is it do you what do you do? You guys get together for some beer and pizza and just kind of hash ideas and then storyboard things or, you know, trying to make each other laugh? How does it how does it work for you guys? Yeah, I mean, we're there every day. We 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 share an office. We uh we so if we had beer and pizza every day, I think it'd be problematic. Uh <laughs> <laughs> um you know, for he and I, we've been together so long that I think, you know, I'll know if he's not liking something that I'm writing and vice versa is true as well. Um, I think a lot of times we trust each other. We can kind of get that vibe. I'm sure you guys have been doing this podcast for such a long time. It's like you also probably know like when you're passing off an idea that you're talking about to, and what will some, one of the three of you is, you know, he's going to take it and run with it. You know, you sort of set each other up. And so I think that's, it's similar. You know, I always say like, I don't think you can inorganically create a writing partnership because you're just going to have moments where it gets really tough. And if you haven't come together organically, you're going to be like, why the fuck am I doing this with you? Then anyway, if we're going to get into this like shitty argument, you know, um, <laughs> but, but if you've really like my writing partner and I, we've been together for such a long time, we came up kind of so organically that like, it is like a marriage. It's like, we're having problems. We like ha talk it out, you know, and like we can disagree with each other without thinking the other one thinks we suck, you know? Um, right. So I think it's a lot of like trust, you know, it's trusting that I trust his point of view, he trusts mine. And that way we kind of know what we're working towards. Right on. We're going to, we're going to let you go shortly here, but we got to talk about, and you know, most of us only get to see, you know, the writer's room, which sounds to like most people, like it's probably the coolest, funnest job. You know, you're hanging out in a room with a bunch of other funny people throwing out ideas and that kind of thing. And, you know, we get glimpses of that and stuff like, you know, the South park documentary, and then, but then you also, if you, if you're into, you know, writing and stuff and listening to podcasts with writers and stuff, you also hear horror stories about how, you know, you're, it's not just all fun to get, I was sitting at the table, cracking jokes, making each other laugh, ordering lunch. But then you hear the horror stories about how you're, you know, stuck in a room with no windows until three, four in the morning, like every day of the damn week where the, the person who's the showrunner is just a tyrant and people hate each other and you have to have separate rooms for Democrats and Republicans <laughs> and along. Uh, so what, what's your experience with that and how, you know, what's like your, your, your example of the best of the writer's room, the famed writer's room and the worst? Well, so the best I think is the, the writer's room I've been in for Harley has been the most fun, you know, um, you know, where we run, my partner, I run that show. Uh, and the first season we ran it with first two seasons, we ran it with our friend Dean as well. And, you know, my feeling is a good writer's room is where everybody feels safe to pitch, you know, everybody feels heard. You're out like my feeling, I have kids. Uh, and I am just like, I'm going home to see my kids. Like, I'm not going to miss my kids for some fucking show. Uh, so, <laughs> so I send, I'm at five o'clock, 
I'm out of there. You know, we're, we're leaving, we're getting our work done by five, you know? And so I think it, it, it is a great job. It is the best. When you're in a good room, it's the best thing there is. It's the most, my favorite part of the job. It's a bunch of funny people sitting around, throwing around ideas, thinking, trying to like make each other laugh. Like when you hit on something that everybody's laughing at, there's nothing better. It's, it's literally like, it makes months for me. Uh, you know, so who is the guy? I, I'm sorry. I got to ask who is the guy that comes up with the most obscure Batman characters possible because they're great. I love every, I love kite man. I love the, <laughs> the terrible, like D list wonder woman, bad guys that you have on. Like, I love that shit. Uh, that's who, two, who is two that? people. That's two people on the show. One is my writing partner, Patrick, who is an enormous DC fan. The other is a writer on our show named Jameson Borak, who basically like, I feel like he was raised by, comic books like i don't know if he had actual <laughs> parents he's just like raised by pop culture and he can pull shit from anywhere and so that's why we'll we'll find these like you know really random like he was the one who suggested mad hatter because he loved batman 66 um so though that's that's those guys um oh, love that. and it's great we love we love using those like d-list guys because they don't get any play and it's like a funny that they still exist in this world you know yeah um also, the worst. Oh no! Go sorry. Go ahead. I was just gonna say. Also, my my other favorite character iteration is Clayface being a complete drama queen, yes. like a, like a complete like theater kid on fucking asteroids, like just fucking amazing. Uh, dude, that's an amazing character. I love it. That one is born from two things. From one is like there's so many times you work with an actor, and I get it; they have a hard job, but they'll come to you and they'll be like, "What? What am I playing here? What's my like inspiration?" And and you have to answer those questions because it is important. But like sometimes they do it too much, and you're like, oh, "I don't know, man. What's just say purpose? the lines." Like, yeah, that's my purpose. Just, um, just do it. Just, just fucking, do it. Just you know? play pretend, you fucking idiot. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and Alan Tudyk, Alan Tudyk, who voices Clayface, Alan l went to Juilliard. And so yeah. Alan's like, I know these people, like they, <laughs> I know these people so well, I grew up with these people, like I've, my whole life yeah. has been with these people. And so Alan just like, I mean, he's such a brilliant actor, but he, he just like knew exactly what to do. Um, but so yeah, good. I thought he was British from watching him on Doom Patrol <laughs> for a season of Doom Patrol. I thought he was British. And then I just saw him, I was watching some like Muppets, uh, like Muppet guys talking thing that Frank Oz did. It's like all the Muppet performers. And then he popped up in it and he's just talking it like in, in his regular accent. I was like, he's not British. God damn. <laughs> No, he can do like so anything. Wait, yeah, so he's he not a pirate it. either? Like <laughs> no, he's not a pirate. He's absolutely not a pirate. Um, and I think, yeah, the, the worst writer's room experience is I was on a show uh, maybe like 10 years ago at this point, And we were, it was a terrible show. And it wasn't really like, so it, the hours were like, we were working every every night till like midnight at least and sometimes one or two in the morning and occasionally three or four and it was just non-stop every day and it's one thing if you're like I mean I'm too old I'm 40 now like I'm too old to work those kind of hours but like I was 29 or something at the time 30 maybe and even then it's like it's one thing if you're making like The Simpsons or you're making like Seinfeld or like you know one of those like great shows um but it's even worse when you're making a show everybody knows is a piece of shit and you're like I'm still <laughs> working until two or three every morning and I think part of that is like the 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 people who I came up with like the writers that I came up with who who trained me you know, like the showrunners I work with, they all came from that era of like Friends and Seinfeld and Will and Grace and, and SNL. And it's like all those people work insanely bad hours. Like they would all like the Friends writers room would work till three or four every single day. And so that's what they just like thought the, the norm was. And and it, it, it just becomes this place where you're like, you 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 feel sick when you walk in. You know, I remember I had, I remember on that show, it was the second show I worked on, I think, right after shit my dad says. And I remember thinking like at the, towards the end of it, like I'll go back to waiting tables over this. Like I would rather wow. wait tables than do this show again. <laughs> like do anything <laughs> like this again. It was so, it was such a, a 
just a shitty environment, you know? Um, yeah. And then sometimes you get like, you know, there's a lot of showrunners who are like really abusive in terms of like verbally abusive to people and like, or they have like real like substance abuse problems and they're just like drunk at work, you know, like there's a lot of, there's not a lot, but there's some of that stuff, you know, out there. And I think the thing I always tell younger writers, it's like, you don't have a, you sometimes you just don't have a choice. You're just trying to get whatever job you can get. But, but like, if you can <laughs> try to work for someone who likes their family, because <laughs> if you work for someone who likes their family, <laughs> your life will be much better you know um because they don't want to be there either any longer than they have to you know do you, do you think with everything that's coming out with you know uh, you know the, the cast from buffy and just other things that are coming out where people are like you know you know the uh justice league and all that they're like yeah you know people were gaslighting us or just you know treating us unkind like do you think more and more like with those stories that are coming out people are going to be like holding that in or like no this is my show and i'm still gonna be a dick i think people are gonna uh, i think it's tough because you know for every like joss whedon that gets exposed there are 10 that can, there'll be you should see the text threads i'm on with other writers where they're like wait till they fucking hear what this guy did you know like he hasn't <laughs> you know so there's like all these there's all these like bad actors out there who are not being uh her not being you know uh i think one of the problems honestly i think one of the problems is is that people exalt writers and showrunners to a a a place where they shouldn't you know like they're just human beings right and when you start treating them like these god kings who are have these fiefdoms then they start acting like that you know mm -hmm. and and the reality is is like we were all just like losers in high school. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, just be happy that you have this amazing job that so many people want to have. Like, just be grateful and be nice to people. And, you know, so I think on some level, yeah, like there's going to be some like curbing of behaviors for sure. There are some showrunners who I know to be like really abusive who have like curbed some of that. Um, but I think it, I think it attracts a certain kind of person sometimes to the job and, and they start to just get so like in their own head and full of themselves and all of their worst tendencies come out and they become like, you know, be, so I think you're going to keep seeing it, you know, I think okay. it'll hopefully get better. And I think it has gotten a lot better, but uh, I think that those, you know, you're going to see more and more of that. You're not going to see I mean, more and more of like the people who have done that kind of shit that come to the uh, come to light. Yeah. Well, you know, especially with comedy, too. Like, you know, it's funny. I Jay, you've been we've been texting back and forth in a chain about CBS All Access and been watching a lot of old Comedy Central, you know, half hour specials and stuff and things like that that I didn't I haven't seen in forever. And it's just crazy to see what was comedy back then seems very not very good right now <laughs> and how new comedy has has kind of evolved around that a little bit and like the cream kind of rises to the top no matter what the circumstances are so you know i i would i would assume the same goes for writers yeah definitely i think you know i think that there was a lot of like gatekeeping and there still is a ton of it but i think that there was a lot of gatekeeping early on where it's like you couldn't even get seen by the people who would start your career in in you know the 90s in the 2000s you had to have like a brother you had to do you know you had to like be a certain person you know so i think a little bit of that has been democratized a little bit i think like i think the, the biggest fallacy really is that writing for television is a meritocracy like it's really not it's not a meritocracy the, the, it's not like professional sports you know like you the best right the funniest best writers in the world are not necessarily the ones that are working you know right, right. um Tell and, me so, about it. <laughs> and so you know it, i think it becomes one of those things where yeah like i think the more of the cream is probably rising to the top now than it than it was you right. know um but i think it's still a uh it's still it's still tricky you know right. it's still definitely tricky
Uh, well, dude, this has been awesome, man. We don't want to keep it too too much longer. If you do need any more any Mad Hatter jokes, we've got thousands of <laughs> we have a yeah. whole podcast uh, with two years worth of Mad Hatter jokes. Uh, <laughs> but give us one more, before you go. Give us one more one more scoop for the the next season of Harley. By the way, uh, Harley Quinn uh, on Prime, iTunes. You can get it there. Uh, HBO Max. I think it's on as well. Give us one more. Give us one more tidbit that you can share. All right, I'm going to give you one really good one. Uh, which is that uh, we are going to do something with the Joker that has never been done in any uh, Joker story. Nice. So we're going to, uh, well, two, I'll give you two. Right. The first one is that there's a Joker, there's a standalone Joker episode. Sweet. In, in this, ah. you remember how in season two of Harley, we had a standalone Batman episode? Yes. Yeah. There's a standalone Joker episode in um, season three of Harley. So that's the first one. I'm really, really excited about it. Cool. And then the next one is, um, you know, you, you know how each season we kind of go into one person's brain, like Dr. Psycho will take somebody into it, take the whole crew into someone's brain. Yes. We're going into someone's brain in season three that I think is going to be like really, really special. I think again, is like for DC fans, I think we're going into someone's brain that I think people are really going to get excited about nice. uh, when they see that episode. So good. So excited for that. When is, that we, is there a target date for season three yet? I think it'll probably come out either the very end of this year or the beginning of next, just because uh, animation takes so long. Yeah. So um, it's it's very good animation too, by the way. Yeah. I, it's oh. it's like it's some of, it's it's some of my favorite to watch just because of you know sometimes it's you know, too anime too blocky too whatever and this is great and really really that great. that is all so the just to give a real shout out really quick but you guys as like batman the Man series fans will love this so this woman jen coyle who is the, she's just in charge of all of our animation she's a brilliant artist and uh, her team was this woman, Cecilia Aronovich. And then this guy, Shane Glines, does all of our character designs. And he's Bruce Timm's, like, protege. Oh. And so that, like, oh, wow. that, like Bruce, Batman, the, all three of them, basically. Well, Jen and Shane, they worked under Bruce for, like, such a long time. And Bruce taught them, basically, like, how to do what they do. Um, and they're super talented in, in their own right. And so they're just like animation wizards who will not accept anything looking like shit. It drives them crazy. So, so that, that, that's really great to hear because they think about that stuff all the time. I'm always like, it looks fine. And they're like, no, it doesn't. We need to fix this and this and this. <laughs> Man, anything else to plug? You're uh, at Justin, uh, Justin underscore Halpern on Twitter. Anything else? Uh, you know, I think that's, that's it for now. Awesome, man. Well, we appreciate the time, dude. We're, we're huge fans and wish you uh, nothing but continued success. Keep Thank you so work. much, guys. I appreciate you having me back on. I'll see you in another 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sweet. man. Thanks, man. Hey, also, I got to say, my, uh, my wife is a huge fan. She told me to say she said she's oh. a big fan and that she, that she loves Harley Quinn's her favorite character, and you guys are doing a great job with her. She's, she's oh that's great i mean that's that's the best thing to hear because it's like you know i didn't create that character so i felt a lot of responsibility to be like there are a bunch of people who like this character like i yeah. don't want to ruin it for them you know? yeah great job thousand girls storming you at comic-con <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> you with exactly <laughs> uh well thanks so much guys i appreciate yeah, it we appreciate Thank you, you. Much, thanks man. a lot we'll uh we'll we'll post we'll post it up and uh, tag you there when it goes live if you feel like uh, retweeting it Awesome. Thanks, guys. We'll do Thanks, it. Jason. See you, Rob. Take night, care, man. guys. Bye. All right. Do a quick wrap up. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'll keep it going. Oh, shit. It's all right. Can you do it? I think you can do it again. I'm still rolling. Yep. I can do it again. Okay. There we go. All right. Go ahead. Cool. Well, that was awesome. Thanks to uh, Justin for uh, joining us, and that was cool. I liked hearing uh, the very, very beginnings of, um, you know, how they sent out letters, the old school style, and they yeah, gotta, I mean, it sounded a little grim for people trying to make it as writers now. Yeah, man, because just there's so there's so many people. Everybody's 
doing it every you know everybody's do, doing this so yeah and if you're just like <laughs> a straight up writer like it's hard because you got to not only take whatever you're writing and put it out there in some way shape or form you know like if you just you like to write sketches like well now you have to have make your own sketches or find people to you know do what you're writing you know team up with people who can write and edit and produce and act and all that kind of stuff but uh you know i guess he, i guess it was helpful that he said the cream does rise a little bit to the top <laughs> yeah yeah he's like no it's not a meritocracy at all it's like oh boy no kidding uh, i mean but i think twitter is like yeah no kidding like here's a terrible hacky joke that has 50,000 retweets yeah like, right what doesn't make any sense it doesn't make any sense well i think it kind of does because even back then and now it's, it's it's all about like your connections right and if you have someone that you're friends with that has a great social media following they'll retweet and everyone's like oh yeah why not like it, it we become monkeys to that right it's like it's well, always you know, about it's yeah. always about who you know and you know it's just <laughs> there's always different hurdles that you know you got to just you know for writing or whatever the case may be is you got to find like all right i i all right, I, I think I mastered this. And then the next day you like, there's three more avenues you have to like fulfill and like to try and get your hopes, uh, you know, uh, uh, fulfilled and like, Hey, I'm, I want to be a writer on this show, but like, cool. You did a, now you gotta do B, C and D. So good luck. <laughs> so, and just the, just uh, the pressure alone to just produce stuff, just to, like, you have to continue to produce things like your great creative writing. You got to, continue to be creative and and you can't falter and everything's got to be better than the last and you got to grow and you got to you always have to have ideas it's like jesus that's like it takes a special person to really you know nail it on a you know something super entertaining like this is thanks uh, on. <laughs> <laughs> right on well uh that was cool and uh excited uh for the mad hatter and freaking oh my there. gosh that Great. brought me so much joy to hear that man that was uh, if we get if we get a hat factory <laughs> if we get a fucking if i'm telling <laughs> let me just say something right now i'm i'm calling this out right now if we get a hat factory if we get one of those in this episode 12 years was worth we we fuck <laughs> this is yeah like, <laughs> like we, we I think we could him? prove in a court of law that we <laughs> created something from <laughs> like we are Hollywood writers. Well, can we like can we get him to like maybe besides if they do Hat Factory, that just be like the next couple of lines would be like, "What are you, master of none over there?" Yeah, you're right. Something <laughs> just like a quick. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's a penny. Just put us in as writers, just so we can say we were Hollywood writers. Just, right. Yeah. Just for, for the Mad Hatter. Yeah. Help me, help me. Give me one of those too. All right. Well, fun times. Thanks again to Justin Halper and uh, check him out on Twitter at Justin underscore Halpern. And if you're not watching Harley Quinn, well, why are you listening to us? <laughs> Seriously. Watch it. Yeah, that's right. Stupid. <laughs> All right. uh, this has been the Poster's Guide to Writing. I'm Jay for Mike and Art. See ya. See ya.